And what's this one? What's this one? This is a fun little thing. This is a thing that we call TinyBot. And we were working on a project that was actually about security in ROS. And we needed to demonstrate that we had uh, made a secure system that you couldn't hack into. And so we actually built an entire Lego town and then had robots like this running around. And we showed when there was security was turned off that the bad guy could take over the robot and then mow down the Lego people. And then when the security was turned on, the bad guy couldn't take over the robot. So we saved the Lego town. There's, there's really, there's technology, there's the software, and then there's the people. The Lego Garage was this really kind of strange place just strange enough to be able to bring the community together. It was to make robotics better as fast as possible. The results we got were because it was open source, it was a really good idea, it was the right value proposition for those grad students, and they told their friends and it just you know spread through the entire robotics community. So the next thing you knew, we had a uh, huge project that half the world was using to do robotics. <laughs> we were working on trying to make robotics happen as an industry, so moving it out of just research labs and into the real world, that was our goal. And one of the great things that came out of it was the robot operating system. So this started for me when I was starting my PhD program with my partner in crime in this, Eric Berger. Now, we studied a bunch of things going on in robotics. At the time, uh, you've talked to Brian Gerke, right? So at the time, there was a platform called Player Stage, which was a very successful open source project in, in robotics, and basically like robots that drive around. So we talked to everybody using that. We're like, why isn't this used in more advanced robotics? Uh, and that's when we got this message of like, look, nobody's even close to standardizing how did this, this system should work. So for a long time in robotics, it had been the case that you would get your, hand on, get your hands on a robot and then you would write a whole bunch of what we would call infrastructure software to go with it. And that was just to make the robot vaguely work. And then after that, you could do what you actually wanted to do, which was to do an experiment, solve a problem, uh, test a hypothesis. And the goal with Ross was to make it so that we took care of all that. ROS is what makes it possible for body parts of the robot to talk to all the other body parts and for humans to filter through all of those messages that come spewing out of the machine, um, picking out the ones that we care about and using that to build applications on top of. That's how I think of it. The software has to combine together. and If you want to do a big multi-person effort, you have to have a framework for that. Um, ROS was that framework. What it means is that if you want to develop a new robot, you don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to do the fundamental you know, sensors talking to computers. You don't have to do the fundamental navigation. You don't have to do the fundamental perception. That's all built into ROS. That notion, that core idea that I can use ROS and, and you know, take my piece of this, but combine it with everybody else's best of breed stuff, that's a really powerful idea, and that idea spread like wildfire. They really started to cement this, this idea uh, in a strong way that you can have platforms that are beyond just a standalone arm or standalone mobile base. You can have a very complex standard platform that has all of this capability, and I think giving away the first 11 PR2s had a big impact in that way. PR2 is a robot designed from the ground up to enable software developers to focus on new ideas and new technologies. PR, the PR2 stands for Personal Robot 2. It was a combination of like 
the sci-fi idea of a robot and the reality of what is required to make a robot that can do all of the things that you want a robot to do. I think of the PR2 as really a research platform for trying out ideas and prototyping, but you, no one wants that thing in their house. Like, it will destroy your carpets, first of all, and freak out your dog. The PR2 was not the point. <laughs> it was practice for Ross. This week, uh, doing the normal things, working out a few new processes with the Ross 2 Technical Steering Committee. My memory recalls a, I believe it was a Friday afternoon, might have been a happy hour, sitting outside of Willow Garage, and Brian proposed this idea to me about splitting off to form the Open Source Robotics Foundation. And that's really the point where we took responsibility for Ross. They took up the gauntlet, right? They kept the RossCon conferences going. They've kept the community growing. And that's really accelerating not just robotics research, but robotics industries everywhere. One of the robots behind me, we created in five months from scratch, like hardware, software, everything. It was running and it was riding on elevators, right? How do you do that that fast? The answer is Ross, right? There's no way we could have done it without that. I mean, Ross, Ross really transformed everything. It was changing a culture that was very insulated to a culture of how do we make things reproducible. The community would not be at the size it is and people would not be having the commercial impact they're having, certainly if we had gone a different way with how we licensed it. And then without that one common platform that everybody's building on and contributing to and enabling people to build on each other, without that common platform that brings the community together, robotics would definitely not be where it is today. <laughs>